Namaste and in La Catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest coming from Cyprus is Linda LeBlanc. She is a residential and outreach trainer for the Monroe Institute, very interesting organization. We'll talk about that. And she's also a, an elected town counselor for Pegaea. Cyprus, and I hope I pronounced that right. She's an author, teacher, public speaker with interest in politics, social systems, structures, ecology, meditation, consciousness exploration, parapsychology research, reincarnation, and even UFOs. Linda, wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much, uh, Zen. It's nice, nice to have some time with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a while in developing, which is great. And it gives us time to kind of let the wagon circle a little bit and prepare us further, <laughs> right? With those yeah, exactly. things that come yeah. up in the process. So speaking of being in process, as a, a youngster, you know, you've got some really wide variety or a wide variety of interests. And yet there's a core that seems to come from that inner place that most of us are bereft of in life mm -hmm. with half inside and half outside. And we're you know, kind of figuring out the inside side now. <laughs> what did you experience as a child that led you in into this phenomenal region of mind, body, and spirit reality? Well, I think, you know, I come from a big family and there were seven children. I was the oldest daughter, the second, second born. Mm -hmm. And it was a Roman Catholic family. We were sort of Irish, French Canadian. <clears throat> and I mean, in, in with the Catholics, you know, we believe in uh, life after death and that there is a spirit and God and all of that. And my uh, younger sister was very psychic. And she used to get what we call the death dreams. She would know when something was going to happen and somebody would would, would die. And it, it was very frightening, actually, especially for her. But oh for God. all of us, it was because in, in those days, we didn't really have the context. Um, certainly with what I know now and I've been, but it, it sort of sparked my interest. Nobody was denying the possibility that my sister was getting this information. And it were really bizarre circumstances that you it, it couldn't possibly be just a coincidence. I mean, right. And she, she's still very psychic. And, and I think it sort of runs in, in the family, because <clears throat> I certainly um, have it to some degree. That'd I think it, yeah. Were your parents uh, receptive to that? Did they have a hard time with it? Because I know for me mm -hmm. growing up, there was a disconnect. The The listening wasn't there to be able to discuss those things openly. Mm. Well, I mean, it wasn't dismissed, but it wasn't really encouraged because, you know, they didn't have the resources of how to integrate it. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you go and you study parapsychology and and mm -hmm. your death experiences, these are all things I did after. And you just think, well, th that gives you a context in which to integrate experiences like this. But we, we didn't have it at that time. But I mean, I can remember when I was about 12 years old, going to the library and reading about Edgar Casey. And I was very much encouraged in my family and at school that, oh, these are really interesting subjects. Yeah, why don't you read it and talk about it? And so, and I mean, that was, you know, I'm almost 70 now. So that was, you know, 60 years, years ago. ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 55 years ago. So uh, it's gone by pretty fast, but <clears throat> there's been a lot of experiences and lots of fun. Uh, and I know with my sister, who was very psychic, uh, she had two children. And when her her youngest son was just a couple of years old, and she realized he would, he would be saying, Mommy, I'm up on the ceiling looking down at you. So he was having out-of-body experiences. <laughs> and so she, she was asking me about this, because at that time we'd gone to Monroe Institute and mm -hmm. had been working on these issues. And she said, what do I do? I don't want him to grow up fearful and afraid and not knowing what this is. So there was, there was some quite nice books out for parents about children having these kinds of experiences. That's a, a well 
oh gosh um received i guess for for parents who actually think to look for those resources not always yeah. do they because there's still you know, as we mentioned earlier there's that cognitive dissonance yeah these things are possible <laughs> and yet nah, that's a little too freaky for me i don't know if i'm going to deal with this or not yeah exactly yeah how did that affect the in the the growth of your understanding through your awareness of your sister and, and your studies uh, or your reading with Casey and others like that and how did that then move into your you know young adult years what what was that like because the, and the reason I'm asking is because mm -hmm. a lot of our viewers are still very young and mm -hmm. and without resources because mm -hmm. you know they're just not available they are available they just don't know how or where to, how to find them. them yeah right mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think um, one of the most important things is is to try to keep your feet on the ground, keep balanced, because this stuff can be pretty wild. I mean, mm. I was interested in ghosts, and I used to play with a Ouija board with my sister, and we scared ourselves silly, because I mean, <laughs> right. we were actually getting things. I really don't oh, recommend yeah, that, happen. but... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recommend people do that, especially young people, because it's it's good experience, but it can get sort of out of, out of balance. And yeah. often with that, you're sort of connecting with lower level entities, right. I guess right. you could call them. And you really want to go as high as you can and sort of get beyond the silly stuff and get to the real core issues of what's this all about and what's my role in this and how 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 can i find out more about right. understanding this and growing into it and having a meaningful life mm -hmm. absolutely and i think it's an important part of that is exploring the unexplained or as they call the paranormal um, or you know the psychic phenomena it has a lot to offer right. because it's 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 calling into question a lot of things we don't think about but well what is that what is this world i'm experiencing and it, it has a lot to offer it really but, does and i think a lot depends on who your friends are uh and of course, it, when I got a little bit older, I was I was smoking a lot of marijuana, <laughs> which probably a little bit too much yeah. for the time, and I had some pretty wild experiences. But you know, just take and it you easy. You really don't the need 70s, that. Though, right? What's that? I said, and you can still remember the seventies. Uh, what was the phrase? Oh, I sure can. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that same way. And and uh, in the and during that time, I was. Um, 18 in 1975 and, and had an interesting spiritual awakening and nobody to talk to i talked to my parents about it they sent me to a psychiatrist which oh dear may not happen often enough and i was very um I'll, I'll just say blessed with this individual who had an understanding of what i had gone through and after a few visits and talking with me uh, asking a lot of questions just listening he said you know what it seems is that you've gone through a spiritual awakening why so mm -hmm. young i'm not sure because most people don't go through it till their mid 40s mm -hmm. if they ever do and mm -hmm. at the time i really didn't understand what he said but it gave me some framework as okay this is great um at least i'm being listened to and, and not dismissed so exactly. but what was funny he says uh you know i want to show you something come here and he had his office in an old historic home in uh, downtown anderson indiana and we walked up the stairs he opened up a door and my heart literally exploded at the, that moment and there were these metaphysical signs and posters and all kinds of books in this room and a deck wow. and a uh, card table with a deck of tarot cards on them Oof. and i see this and i'm thinking psychiatrist right because this is a wow, you were lucky conservative <laughs> area right and I was like what the heck is going on he says you know what those are I said yeah they're throw cards and he says uh you know what they are and, and how they're used and I did and, and so he says have you ever had your cards read and I said no he said would you like said, absolutely right so then mm -hmm. more stuff came out that I hadn't talked about and at the end of it he says you know my advice to you is just keep your mouth shut <laughs> And people aren't going to understand you and mm. i tend to be a blabbermouth so i didn't quite listen to all of that yeah, and pick stuff. your moments yeah yeah and, and i didn't because i was still a teenager and didn't really care 
Um, however, the following year, I had just the opposite experience. I got beat up at a frat house. My parents were concerned. And instead of going home, they decided that I needed to stay in the hospital for a little bit. And so I figured, okay, blow to the head, possible concussion, overnight observation. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Not mm. what they meant. And so the psychiatrist there took the opposite approach, looked at me from a DSM-4 viewpoint oh, God. and yeah. labeled me medication manic yeah. depressive paranoid schizo schizophrenic and put me on 2000 micrograms of thorazine a day Whoa. now the interesting thing was in, in doing research about it later i should have been a lump in a corner mm. on that much i wasn't i was up playing ping pong beating the male nurses <laughs> that took some agility that should not have been present on that medication treating me for what I supposedly had, right? Yeah. So yeah. they didn't, you know, it wasn't until I uh, I talked to the doc and let him, told him what he wanted to hear rather than try to explain me to him. Mm -hmm. And then he said, oh, I told my parents, miracle cure, he's coming out of it. I think we'll be fine now. <laughs> um, you know, what it yeah. did is it set me up uh, as, um, I was really, scared to talk about it afterwards i would shake so bad on the inside when the questions mm. would come up from others as to how far do i divulge mm. and i'd shake so bad that my body would tremble because i okay. wanted to be authentic and honest and i knew that if i was i might end up in the hospital again mm. so yeah. you know it took a couple three years to get over that and i'm wondering you know, in those kinds of experiences, what have you found with others of, of similar things? Mm. I'm sure you've run into in your travels and the work that you do. What could you advise to some of those to maybe help get them through when that other kind of help isn't available? Yeah, I mean, I, I keep talking about balance. Mm -hmm. And very often, you know, people have really very intense experiences that are difficult to integrate and understand and it is sort of a fine line between going over into this sort of darker uh, unsound world i suppose you could call it and there are lots of people in institutions that really have had psychic experiences and they just haven't been able to integrate them mm -hmm. and it's not to say that there aren't actually conditions where people are say schizophrenic or sure. they're out of balance but i think one of the things to, to keep in mind if you have experiences like this like hearing voices or and i've worked with people who who were diagnosed as schizophrenic with the monroe institute uh, that people come to me because we're exploring consciousness and mm -hmm. people hear about what happens during the workshops and things and, and that kind uh, of diagnosis yeah. doesn't make sense when you have a sound mind and the rest of your life is together yeah it, it's about being able to integrate it in a balanced way and um you know i think there's a lot of things people can do to keep themselves sort of grounded I mean, the food you eat is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, you you want to get away from junk food, additives. These things just sort of ramp up your body in an unhealthy way. And if you can just eat really fresh, clean food as much as you can, it'll really make a difference in how your mind works. And um, that will help you to integrate. And I mean, I'll tell you a story about a, a mother who brought me her son and he had been living in england and he had been diagnosed as schizophrenic in and out of mental homes and i mean he was young he was like 18 not even 18 years old mm. and she was worried sick about him and she brought him here to cyprus and she found him he was on the um, living homeless didn't know where he was for a long long time and she tracked him down found him brought him here to cyprus where it's a nice sunny environment in the mediterranean and a friend of hers had done a workshop with me and she said look can can she talk to you and i said okay well bring him around i said we can just sit and talk and see see how how he is how he feels right and he came 
And because we've got some of the sound technology we use in the, with the Monroe Institute um, can be helpful for helping the brain to work better. Mm -hmm. And we do well, have the stuff to help. Hemisync work was to, was designed to bring both hemispheres into balance. Yeah, so you work into a whole brain state. Right. So I thought, well, he can come and we can sit together. And I played. There's one song for, for one beautiful music that's been around since the early 1990s called Remembrance, and it's for focus. And we used it a lot for for children in particular who have uh, learning difficulties, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, ADD or ADHD, and it helps to sort of make their brain work better. And so I thought, well, let's, he came with his mother and we sat in my living room and he was no eye contact, just very, very sort of dark and very, you know, constrained and big guy. And so we just sat there quietly. I said, well, I'm going to play a little bit of hemisync music for you. And so we just listened to it quietly for half an hour. And I said, well, he didn't say anything. I said, well, do you like it? He said, mm -hmm, yeah. And so that was sort of it. And so I, I told him, I said, look, you can take some of these. You can play it and listen to it as much as you like. And I said, really eat natural, clean food. No junk food. And then I didn't hear anything from him for a couple of years, not a word. Mm -hmm. And then I was down on the beach where there was a jazz festival going on. And I was sitting there with a couple of friends. We were enjoying the music. All of a sudden, this gorgeous big guy came up. He looked like he just set off, stepped off a beach in, in Hollywood, you know. And he said, Linda, Linda, you saved my life. And it was the same guy. So he cleaned up his diet. The hemisync helped. And he found himself and, and he was able to come back from the brink and, and have a meaningful life. And it was just so wonderful oh, yeah. to have an experience I, like that. Yeah. And especially to have somebody come back. I know I, I, I've taught high school for a number of years and, and I had a couple of students see me out someplace. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, not even close to the school several years later. And, uh, and yelled out my name and ran up and gave me a hug. Oh, right? nice. Yeah, and yeah it, it was just, ah, oh, it, it felt so good to have that kind of impact to where, you know, a, a young person yeah. feels that way and, and is open and authentic enough to express themselves in such a way. Very true. Yeah, yeah. It makes so we don't really know what effect we have, mm -hmm. but, you know, we in our lives, we're sort of building skills and learning things for ourselves on a personal level and finding that, well, you know, th this can help other people just by talking with them and, and sharing, you know, the workshops and the different, different things we do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just hope that, you know, there are little pearls that you sort of throw into the, into the pool yeah. and you get the ripples come out. And yeah, I think we can all do that no matter what, what's going on in our lives we all have something valuable to share with others and uh, i think it's finding what our gifts are very true and sometimes that's a decades-long process too right? that's true and i was a bit of a life. late developer myself so <laughs> it's kind of inc incremental skill building uh, mm, true true it, it really is now with the um with the advent of the audio technology and the understanding of how sound affects the brain and, and things like this, do, mm. do you think that because of that, now that maybe that helped facilitate the understanding of the frequencies and, and their applications and, and understanding of how uh, even that grew into the quantum theories that we have now? Because I, I if I'm not mistaken at least some of these modern theorists have been familiar with or gone through the institute yeah we've had a lot of people come i mean we know we had um, the cia did a their document that was made quite a fuss on tiktok some years ago, within the last two or three years about um it was a report that the cia wrote on their assessment of the gateway voyage which is our first program 
mm-hmm. of sort of going through portals and different dimensions and and training because of course it was they were looking at um, what became known as remote viewing right so sort of your psychic spying so this, that's a different type of very special um, psychic uh, awareness under very controlled scientific mm-hmm. conditions so right. it's Rush pretty hard to dismiss and- that Lynn Buchanan and, and uh, Joe McMonagall. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, there was a whole crew of folks that got yeah. together. And, um, and of course, the military came to Bob Monroe because they heard what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And he was working with some of the early remote viewers and designing special sound frequencies to help get them into what they called the zone. Right. So they could move very quickly into deep meditative states and then do their remote viewing. So the cool down period was was shortened so they could shift into this much quicker. Mm-hmm. And, and you of know, course the- down and, and that kind of effect, and I wanna get back to that because it's important. Uh, mm. I just wanted to add that this um, friend of mine that had known Bob many years ago, he's been working with sound technology for quite some time and they mm. figured out frequencies that help plants absorb nutrients better uh-huh. and grow much faster organically and produce uh, much more than normal mm-hmm. and uh-huh. so these kinds of things you know it's like uh, it, it, he made the reference of it's like um when you put a bunch of sand in one of those sifters right when you put it there if you don't move it sand doesn't go anywhere but as soon as you move it then the sand starts filtering through the, the mesh well, it's this kind of the same way with phytonutrients is they're absorbed from mm. the ground. You set up the frequency that opens up the plants that have them absorb it faster. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. triggers involved. So, you know, this is this kind of technology could help really help feed the world. And so we're in the, the initial well, stages of introducing that. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So these kinds of things that, you know, the frequencies affect the body, affect the of course, yes, yeah. affect the earth. You know, we're we're mm. in this vibrational field. Um, yeah. Question on the on the other things you mentioned: the gateway experience and the multiple multiple dimensions and remote viewing and things like that. Um, and you were there, and I believe you said ninety four. Mm-hmm. In eighty nine, I was introduced to William Swigard's work, uh, mm-hmm. which was a um, I don't know if he was a parapsychologist, uh, but he was an explorer in the 50s, and he developed a, a technique called multi-plane awareness. Oh, and I'm it, not familiar with that. Yeah. Um, briefly, yeah. It, it takes the experience. It's a facilitated process like Gateway. Um, the facilitator takes the experiencer through nine planes of consciousness mm. and using the light body. Um, mm-hmm. And that's developed in the initial part of it. And then you move out or put it out, project your consciousness into it, and then go through these various dimensions and integrate the body that you have on mm. each of those dimensions. And then look out through its eyes. Fascinating mm. process. I got mm. to the end of it and got the prompt of get ready to come back. I mean, it goes beyond <laughs> those nine. The, the 12th plane is where you end up, but there's mm-hmm. more. And you're given a brief experience of it and then brought back. And, and you know, even who is it, Nepi and Close now have said that there is a nine dimensional framework that the humans are uh, able to experience incarnate. The mm. rest of it is still available, but it's not available to, you know, a physically mm-hmm. incarnate being. Mm-hmm. So uh, at the end of it, I got the prompt to get ready to come back. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm ready. And I'm back. <laughs> And I turned to look at him and he says, "Uh uh-oh. And I said, what? And he says, well, that was just a prompt to get ready to come back. You were supposed to drop your bodies off where you got them. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, you know, a newbie in the experience kind of flippant with the whole thing. I thought, oh, well, whatever. And then that night I was awakened in the middle of the night with this noise, startled awake. And mm. there were all kinds of, of, you know, tones, sounds, voices. It was just a mish, you know, like a big party. And I didn't know what was going on at the time. Didn't even mm-hmm. think about it. 
And then a couple of weeks later, I had a psychic friend spend the night and middle of the night, she sits straight up in bed and she says, well, my God, how can you sleep in here? There's got to be at least a dozen <laughs> different beings in this room. And it wasn't until she said that, that I thought, well, gosh, is that me? Hmm. Because I never dropped those bodies off. So you didn't, you they didn't leave them to, there. Yeah. yeah. So somehow they're still active. Mm. Yeah, and a little more present so that presented <laughs> challenges for me for a while too and yet it you know in uh when i was pre uh, prepping for an interview with jeffrey Mishla, i went over some of his old shows and found oh. uh, vernon neppy's talk about uh -huh. the mm. triadic dimensional distinction vertical paradigm i think is what it's called mm. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. I said, oh, great. Here's the science that <laughs> is evidence of the experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, how, do, how does that integrate? Because now that we have that framework, how do we activate it within each of us in order to experience it? Now, and mm -hmm. so this is kind of what I see or, or what I sense that um, the gateway experience has done for many, uh, yourself included. Right, it has opened mm -hmm. up this whole new world. What were the types yeah. of things that you experienced as you began to open up to these things mm -hmm. that were things that you had to maybe reframe or reconsider mm -hmm. or change your thinking completely about? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I I didn't have anything that made me change my thinking. Okay, because I I was aware. For me, it was more a remembering of oh how could I be so stupid to have forgotten all of this <laughs> that's what it was like for me it was like oh my goodness where have you been <laughs> you know right. and I mean it was just a knowing and like I, I you, you would sort of I, I went out of body on one of the nights as well I mean I've been having out of body experiences since I'd been a young a young girl mm -hmm. but they were spontaneous and we didn't know what they were uh, it was just sort of freaky things were going on, right? <laughs> could you sense them? Yes, they're absolutely freaky. But could you sense them? Uh, once you started having them, there are indicators, at least for me, this is what I observed. There were these sensations, precursive. Mm -hmm. the yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole range of... Um, uh, sort of a spectrum of the out-of-body experiences but mm -hmm. I had all the classic ones where um, you would get the vibrations in the body uh, body paralysis as well mm -hmm. uh, and then like just waves and waves of energy moving in the body and then a huge noise in your head like there was a train in your head and then pop you're out right and I mean that's sort of the, the classic one of the classic out of body, uh, but very often you do get the vibrations because your energy is shifting. Mm -hmm. You're you're changing your level of consciousness, and you're you're moving into your energy body and away from your physical body. And this is how the energy is adjusting to sort of get ready for takeoff, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's a, there's all kinds of different ranges. Um, some people are going out of body without any of that sort of drama with the physical of actually sure. popping out. Well, the reason I asked that question is because when people begin to have these experiences, mm -hmm. the first thing that they go through is a fear of death. Of course, yes. Yeah. And yeah. so this is a natural part of this. And yet, mm -hmm. no, you're not dying. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah. You right. are more than your body. Yeah, right. Yeah. And yet we still have to acquiesce to that letting go of the fear and just moving into mm. that experience as opposed to pulling back because you can still you can make the choice to go of course yeah yeah exactly yeah and you know sometimes it takes a while for the the emotional body and the mental body to catch up because mm. you can have these experiences and then you think well you know, it's taken me a little bit of time to really get my head around this of what is that all about? And why? Because, well, yeah, what does it, what, what does it have to offer to me? And what is this experience? What's the value of that in my life now? Mm -hmm. And and how can it help me to move forward in a meaningful way? 
of what what I have to do or what I want to do or what what would be the best thing for me to do at this point in my life because these things can they're all there to support us in finding out more about what this mystery of life is about Absolutely. because it's it's such a strange thing we're all here and we all think we're separate but we're really all connected mm -hmm. otherwise we wouldn't be communicating at all especially like like right now we're tens of thousands of miles away from each other and it's uh here we are virtually on i mean it's pretty amazing stuff it uh, really is and and, yeah. and it also um connects so, so back to the question of why mm. in this experience and you know we and maybe you can validate this as well that we tend to push and pull energy with our will mm. And not necessarily know the importance of what we're doing and whether it's actually empathically resonant mm -hmm. for our mm -hmm. good. And yet, you know, we sometimes can do that. However, it seems that with these kinds of experiences, it teaches more of the access to flow, which yeah. is the release of attachments to the outcome and just paying mm -hmm. attention to the signs and synchronicities of the journey. And so this is a level of awareness that brings your attention, intention, and interaction more focused mm -hmm. on um, just allowing it, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, do you find, and, and the allowing and the flow and, and the information, the, the data transfer that takes place that gives you the indications of, okay, this is kind of a direction you want to go or, mm -hmm. or maybe not, right? How do yeah. those kinds of things, what are the types of sensations that you've noticed as you've developed that others might be able to tune into or at least have more aware mm -hmm. awareness of in their own process yeah i mean that that's a really good question i mean you know when you're talking about flow mm -hmm. uh it, it makes me think of of really being in tune with nature and our real way of being and we we really do get sort of out of step with it's so easy to do this of just sort of forgetting that we are natural beings and we're part of nature. And if you think about nature, nature wants to flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, we as our human species, we can build dams and do all kinds of stuff we want. But nature will always find a way because nature will flow. And so when we're able to be part of that flow, instead of fighting it, it's like being in the river. You don't want to be swimming up river all the time. You want to go with the use the the power of nature to go with the flow of the river and lead your life like that mm. so that yeah. you're not always battling up river and 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 Just confronting resistance all the time yeah, exactly and the resistance is where we kind of experience the kerfuffles that's um, exactly yeah in this flow and in this natural order if you will mm. are these kinds of experiences aligning us more with that natural order within us that then also like you said before ripples in in mm -hmm. the bomb mm -hmm. spirit that others can feel and sense even though they may not be consciously aware of it there's a subtle shift in their life things of, of yeah definitely a little less yeah. chaotic let's mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. Now, you... Yeah, and I, I think, you know, as we're, we're coming more into balance and we're actually shifting our, our vibration rate. And as we become, you know, into a higher vibration rather than a lower sort of base vibration, we're going to access completely different way of being because it's all energy and as you're you're shifting your energy and and sort of accessing different ways of being uh it 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 it, it will change your life and Absolutely. i think that's why we're here is to experience that and, and apparently there's even some science uh, uh <laughs> about that there's a a russian academian that my wife um presented to me and 
her dissertation is in Russian. I don't speak Russian. My wife is from St. Petersburg. So it's a little, lovely city. Uh, and oh, yeah. And it's got English subtitles. So the woman's name is uh, Valentina Morovina, and she w spent 10 years. Now she's got degrees in, I believe, microbiology and astrophysics. Interesting combination, first of all. She's done mm. some research on the scientific proof of how this frequency shift is actually changing our genes and opening mm. up new mm. genetic path or, or options for us. That's part of this evolutionary process that we're going through as a humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so now she spent the last 10 years finding all the scientific proof that, yes, what we've been calling the ascension is actually happening on a bio-spiritual level. Mm -hmm. It's a combination mm -hmm. of the two. And so here's all this evidence of it. Now, granted, you have to be willing to ask the questions and seek it to find it. However, mm -hmm. this kind of supportive information mm -hmm. coming from a person of that level of academic and scientific um, respectability, for one, mm -hmm. offers a, a whole new way to explore it. Now, given that and with what you've experienced and, and how this is evolving, do you also feel that this may, you know, we're talking about the, the balance, right? And we mm. are so skewed towards the masculine patriarchal pontificator kind of energy. Technocratic. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and it just doesn't feel comfortable. Mm, exactly. it feels yeah. prescribed and pushed we were talking about push and pull of energy right this is one of the things that we can recognize it doesn't feel right it's probably not so exactly. what can we do yeah. to move beyond that and and perhaps even dipping into our historic past as a planet mm. and mm -hmm. pulling what we've been missing back up and, and i'm specifically referencing the feminine Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. had some understanding with that, especially being on Cyprus. What are the kinds of things that, that you found in, in your considerations uh, of here, you know, we're at this place. What do we, how is that balance going to occur and what needs to be introduced or reintroduced yeah. in order for it to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's one of the, the great lessons for me in this life is exploring this male-female uh, relationship and looking at going back thousands of years ago, um, sort of way before Christianity and, you know, maybe 5,000 BC, so I'll say 7,000 years ago, it was a time when women had a quite different role in society. It was what what's called a, a partnership uh, hierarchy. So the men and the women worked together in a completely different way than we have in our Western world. And um, that was sort of thrown over and was taken over by, by the aggressive males. And we've been sort of under that thumb for 7,000 plus years. And I think this is part of that balance that's going back to it. And what's particularly interesting for me on a personal level here in Cyprus in exploring this, is, you know, I'm, I'm an island in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's very sort of macho Mediterranean here. You know, we're, right. we're very close to the Arab world and uh, Turkey is just north of us. And it's a very male dominated societies, uh, even more so than say in Canada or the United States. Sure. And, sure. and I, I realized very quickly being here that this was why I was here, that I was brought back to Cyprus to, to sort of explore this, that there was more that I needed to complete about these relationships. And, and I'm finding that what's going on in the world today is very much a part of that as well. And in Cyprus is in the Greek mythology is the birthplace of the goddess Venus, or as the Greeks called her Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's, there's a special rock where she was brought upon, came in on the foam of the sea. And so this was the erotic love. And in those days, this was maybe late Bronze Age, you're looking, say, 1600 BC, uh, it was very, very pagan, very feminine. Mm -hmm. And it was the women were the priestesses and they ran the temples. And there was a famous temple in my town in Paphos 
um, that was the temple of Aphrodite. And they had the sacred priestesses, and they were using sexual love in the, in, in the altars and in, in the temple that was part of the, the pagan rituals. And so this is, if you look at that with what happened with Christianity that came, say, 2,000 years later and completely switched things around. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the, in the pagan days at the time of, of, you know, the height of this sort of priestess, uh, in those days, women were considered unmarriageable if they were virgins. Wow, that's bizarre. So you had to be deflowered right. in order to be of interest to to a man as as a life partner, uh, as a wife. And I thought that's that was pretty wild. And they used yeah. to have pilgrimage yeah. to the temples, and they had what they called the sacred way, because the, the pilgrims would be. It was. Um, it was a pilgrimage, and they would come, and there were sacred gardens where they would overnight, and then they would walk for miles up to the temple that was up on the hill. And along the sacred way, the the families who lived here and the other pilgrims, they the women would be on the side of the young women on the sides of the roads so that the pilgrims, the males, could come and be with the women to to deflower them and so that they would not be virgins anymore. So this was a pretty wild town back uh, 4,000 years ago. <laughs> right. Um, We've so I thought, well, here I am in uh, Cyprus. I thought that there's things I need to look at here that in, in relation to how do we relate men and women in our world today? Right. And how did we do it before? And and Where nothing's good or bad. It's how you think it, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Now we've got yeah. this overall overarching, um, yeah, marriage is sacred, and, and yet there is no real prep work for it or, or the celebration of, of procreation mm -hmm. even. It's, you know, you don't talk about sex, right? Yeah, there's a lot of inhibitions and, yeah. Right, and suppression. so all of this yeah. suppression has spilled out into society in all kinds of mm -hmm. aberrant ways. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yes. I mean, that's the reality of it, looking yeah. at it from that perspective. Now, you've got to be willing to step back and not hold mm -hmm. a belief system and just look at, okay, here's what's happening. Here's the progression of what happened from a uh, sociological standpoint. And mm -hmm. just this is what is. We, we can't mm -hmm. argue with that. Now, how do we integrate that? How do we move back towards not necessarily become such a promiscuous society, which is what I believe that, you know, the, the religious folk kind of fear that mm -hmm. because it has been, and, and I don't know if this is part of the process, but it would seem that the uh, programming from the patriarchal mm -hmm. system has done away with this openness vulnerability authenticity deep feeling willing to mm -hmm. communicate willing to you know the urge to merge <laughs> anything that's a good one yeah. this day, these days yeah. right and mm -hmm. we have that natural urge that you know our baseline emotion i believe is to love and be loved that's mm -hmm. the core of who we are well how can we address that when we're told that everything that supports that isn't the right way to go mm, exactly. it sets yeah. up that cognitive dissonance that really creates a lot of dis-ease in our society mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how do you see that potentially being worked through uh, and maybe even you know some evidence that you might see of it in, in particular ways not that it's you know shining above all else because these <laughs> the things are kind of hidden at, 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 at least at this mm -hmm. point and they're just being getting to be recognized by others and, and a little more open conversation about it as like we're doing here yeah and i, I think again it, it comes back to to the feminine and the masculine i think both have so much to offer it's the yin yang you know you know the the passivity and the 
aggression. And I mean, it, it's, it's part of nature and it's part of the flow. And mm -hmm. the flow has been stopped and it's been manipulated. And it's time to get back into the flow with how, how we are as a species and the value of the different genders and what each has to offer. Because uh, it, it's, it's just been, I'm, I'm trying to find the right words, it's been manipulated and there's, it's like that, that sacred alchemy that we had as a species with the male and the female has been diverted and it, it's getting very strange in the world now, I find. I mean, this may not be very politically correct to talk about this, but if you just think about what what's really natural and there isn't much in the world today that is natural anymore mm -hmm. because it's been so artificial and everything is sort of yeah synthesized yeah and all this move now towards transhumanism and the merging of artificial intelligence with our species and i'm thinking you know th this is really anti-life and this is anti-feminine and it's anti-male and it's it's against the flow of nature and this gives me hope actually that it will not succeed because it is anti-life or at least it maybe not succeed because it it doesn't seem to be going away at least the the use of ai and development of it however it's the it's the how right? It's how we integrate it, mm. how we determine its use. Is it going to be life-friendly, anthropic? <laughs> it doesn't look that way to me. Well, um, uh, well, that's the fear right now. And so, as you know, what we focus on will create, right? So mm, true, true. It's that, yeah. it's that ability to look at what's happening. Uh, I read an article the other day of the inclusion of emotional intelligence in, the, in AI and things like chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. and I hadn't done anything with chat G GPT yet. And so I thought, okay, I'm, Me I'm, neither. I'm staying away from it. <laughs> well, if you're going to find out, you know, it, it's hard to assess something if you don't know about it or have used mm -hmm. it. Right? So I jumped in and I, I took a chapter out of one of my books. And I put it in chat GPT to see what mm -hmm. kind of, you know, response it would give me. And mm -hmm. I was amazed of the emotional intelligence that was included in the content. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if those kinds of things are beginning to happen, then that kind of gives me hope that, you know, it, it, who knows, AI may be self-regulating from that, that standpoint of realizing that, it is electronic, just like everything else. It's energy, it's pulses mm -hmm. of light passing back and forth. And there's mm -hmm. this certain mm, um, continuity in flow mm -hmm. with all of the other electrons that are in flow mm -hmm. in some way. <laughs> and so there's this natural, again, merging of the two in time as this develops. And it could be, you know, with Moore's law, it, it could be <laughs> very, very soon, right? Because the mm -hmm. things are the time to get things done in that world, in the technical world, becomes less and less as the technology develops. Now there's a, I had an interview with a, a gentleman named Guy Morris, uh, who worked in the tech industry for a number of years as an executive as well. and he had mentioned that there was a program that had been developed at Sandia Labs, which is a known CIA or uh, NSA um, mm -hmm. territory, and it had escaped. And that was how it was written up in, in the newspaper that this program had escaped. Well, mm -hmm. how does a program escape? <laughs> <laughs> So that word, that use of words, and, and it actually had that, and he wasn't sure what it was exactly, but over the years, he started um, delineating, okay, what would a program like that need to have in order to be able to do that? And as he started writing up what it was and sharing that, and he even mm -hmm. had some uh, friends help, and they were developing a, a short 
uh, video series about it. The TV show is what they were developing. The FBI showed up, said, mm, can't do that. How did you mm -hmm. get that information? Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this program that escaped. And if it's got intelligence, well, there's more intelligence than what here is on what's here on the planet. The the higher level of intelligence that mm -hmm. permeates the universe is much more finely tuned. And mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe that program could be used to feed us vicariously <laughs> in the click-throughs or the things that show up in our screen that yeah. take us down the rabbit hole of something that we had questions about, but you know, all of a sudden it shows up and we have the opportunity to do so. Hmm. You know, those aren't coincidences. Oh, no, <laughs> that's for sure. We, yeah. If we begin, you know, uh, kind of peeling back the layers of the onions to look at, okay, how did this happen and what had to be in place and who would be there? Mm, what yeah, would exactly. be there? Or, you know, those kinds of things. It opens up a whole new realm of consideration for that that we haven't had before. It also, pushes that cognitive dissonance to the maximum in those that mm -hmm. have not been willing to look at it yet. Yeah. Yeah. How do you well, see? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of little things running through the world that we're experiencing right now. And um, who knows where it's going really. Do you think that we'll be able to step back and, and look at those subtle indicators soon and maybe learn how to adapt and listen and pay attention and use those as a rudder for the future? Hmm. I don't know. That's a tough question. I'm sort of more focused on disengaging from the current system. Mm -hmm. That's sort of uh, the ruling paradigm, because I think it's 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 collapsing. It's the empire collapse, and rather than looking back on that, I'm thinking I I, I want to be in the moment. I want to be fully present in the flow, in the real world, which isn't this collapsing empire that's around us. That it's not apparent yet that it's collapsed and put my energy and my flow into this natural world that's always been there that we've been sort of suppressing or we've been distracted away from and sort of it's about our attention and our focus do you feel that that, uh, that we really are creators incarnate and just haven't realized it yet oh yes definitely yeah yeah some of us have realized it. It's it's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. And I think it's also a lot of us are very attached to particular results or connected to a particular uh, result. And yeah. um, that judgment about... gets in there and that's where the ego and, uh, you know, you want to rise above that and sure. go straight to the highest vibration and just... Take Do you find that there. that's also um, it could be termed as expectation, right? Mm -hmm. You're projecting what your expectations exactly. are. So exactly. In effect, you know, we're, it's funny. I see our, our consciousness as kind of twofold, like a tesseract, right? Mm -hmm. Our intention mm -hmm. we throw out in front of us, and then we step into it. So what's what we're seeing <laughs> is also that's seeing nice. us, yeah. yeah, right. And so there's this constant ebb and flow. Do you mm -hmm. think that in acknowledging that that we step into a, a greater awareness of those little indicators the subtle signs the the sensations you know the the mm -hmm. we, most of us live from here up we're not aware of that's the true sensations, yeah. the interpretations of them, the the body talk or or anything like that and the body's an instrument we just have to, have to tune it let yeah, alone play in concert so mm -hmm. perhaps we're in the wings of the concert hall learning how to play our instruments now <laughs> very true that's a nice analogy yeah yeah and i think you know it's it's about being conscious and present and what we're thinking and feeling uh just to be aware that we are awareness and what we're thinking and feeling is what we bring into what we do and what we what we are 
and most people are on remote control. Yeah, we're, we're on autopilot. We're not, we're, we're not conscious. Of we're not curious. Our... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's the curiosity. Now, I'm, I'm going to jump to the end of the uh, introduction about the UFOs, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> so um, we're going to leap into this. We're not going to go that far into it. I, I wanted to bring up Wilbert Smith and to see yes. if you're familiar with him. Okay. Especially yeah, you sent me some information about him. I hadn't, I wasn't af aware of him, even though he was Canadian as well. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I wasn't yeah, either. It's, and and yeah, his it's writing edified my own personal experience and understanding. Mm. So it was mm -hmm. like, okay, I could resonate with it. But one of the things, two of the things that he mentions in that, in his conversation, because for our audience, Wilbert Smith was the director of Project Magnet in the 1950s. Project Magnet was Canada's UFO investigation program funded by the Ministry of Transportation. Now, his job put him into contact, actual contact with what he called people from elsewhere. And some of what they told him was at first, we are awareness, and mm -hmm. it depends on our level of awareness as to the kind of reality that we will experience. Mm -hmm. Then they said something also that was, I, I thought, rather um, caused me to be really curious. And that was that time to then is a measurement in the change of entropy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what that said to me was that the more harmonious we get, the less time it's going to take to get things done. Mm -hmm. That's Percent. a nice one. I, yeah. I, I think. And, he all, and then they also said, we don't understand nothingness, which is where everything comes from. That's where they it's start from. Nothing and everything. Yeah. Right. The void. Right. Yeah. And, so, and that's mm -hmm. frightening to humans. The, the unknown, the the nothingness, the void, going mm. into that what we no ego darkness, yeah. right? And yet, that's where we find solace. That that's where we find fulfillment. It's our real, our real being. Yeah, the depth of our being. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Now, how how have you been able to? And this is the tough one, right? How have you been able to articulate that awareness? in ways that are simple and easy for people to understand? Mm. Well, I think personal experience. So what mm. I try to do through the Monroe Institute is to provide opportunities during our, our courses for people to experience exactly that. And, and then, it's, then, experience. it's not something, you know, that, uh, something that occurred to me a few years back just came out of my mouth one day and, and a friend of mine said, you need to write that down. Um, <laughs> it yeah. was, we cannot think our way through a system built on vibration. We have to sense our way through it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as yeah. thinkers, one of the things, this is, you'll love this, um, going back be, before uh, the use of Satan, was in the literature as an adversary or whatever, uh, I was compelled to go to the university library and look the word up to see what its origins were. Uh -huh. And the very first notation was from the Greek, Phaeton, T-H-E-T-A-N, which means thinker. Uh -huh. What was so, that word? Phaeton. Satan. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So Satan became this fictitious enemy that was created in order to dominate and control and manipulate mm -hmm. populations, mm -hmm. right? Through the fear, right? However, the the real adversary is our thinking. And we <laughs> haven't got that, you know, it's like, okay, shut up, listen, pay attention, don't think, ask questions, mm -hmm. and don't try to answer it with what you think you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, the monkey mind gets in there and throws it all away. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 that's okay for a time being. You know, we try to fight our thoughts in meditation. That's not the purpose of it. You watch them, and yeah, they eventually exactly. stop because mm -hmm. you ran out of thoughts. Yeah, and you just let your mind be. 
in that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And some like in using the the tones, the music, the frequencies. You know, it, it assists and it truncates that time. Yeah. You know, of course, like what was a bottle Ramdas, um, uh, Frank Albert when he went to India and found the the guru and gave mm -hmm. him a vial of LSD and the guru drinks it and he says, oh yeah, that's Western man's way of experiencing Eastern realms of, of meditation without <laughs> yeah. the rigors. Yeah. Right? Because mm -hmm. it does it, it takes you there immediately. Well, mm -hmm. you're there, if you're carrying your demons with you, it's not going to be a good place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, you, you need a level of maturity and sure experience of going through and uh, working through these things. So, right. Yeah. And if you want to do it fast, mm, drop a tab, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just remember to keep your feet on the ground, keep balanced, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And and you know, it's funny how much of this, and even uh, the medical world now is opening up a little bit more towards using psychotropics for treatment mm -hmm. of various. Um, yeah, and even microdoses they're finding yeah right yeah well speaking of those by the psychiatrist i mentioned early on he i didn't understand where he got that um understanding from right didn't mm -hmm. really at the time it's just that he was helpful well 20 years later i'd written a bunch of books and i took a couple of them signed copies back and, and i wanted to give them to him met up with him at 77 he was still practicing and he was only there uh, two days a week at that point. However, uh, didn't remember me, but we had a wonderful peer-to-peer -peer conversation. Very nice. Yeah. And in that, he shared that before our time, he had been working with government studies of how LSD was being used on treating vets for PTSD and alcoholism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those were the days, like Dr. Stan Groff, you know, right. uh, really breakthrough stuff as well. Yeah. And then yeah. it disappeared because, I don't know, you know, it was really effective. It's like, how can yeah, you do something that's... that effective? And, and on a regular basis, there were no harmful side effects from it whatsoever. Mm. And then suddenly put it aside. Yeah, that seems to happen quite a bit with all the good stuff, right? Um, it does. Yeah. Well, it um, is maybe it's the meter drop. How can we make money off of it? We can't make money off healed people. Well, that's what happens when you have a, a corporate sort of capitalistic uh, patriarchal system, I think. You know, that's this is why I, things have to have to shift. I had a friend say that, you know, you can trace every global calamity that we're experiencing to capitalism now that doesn't mean yeah. capitalism is bad mm. however the the agenda of people of profit over people and planet ought to be replaced by people and planet over profit doesn't necessarily do away with profit it's just how it's garnered and gained yeah yeah it's gone way 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 beyond its sell by date i mean it's gotta go <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah, absolutely so how do you see things you know in, in the near future um granted progress is slow and, and humanity's kind of like a dinosaur that's just got its front leg up and mm -hmm. taken a step yet um, yeah. what do you see what would you hope to see as indicators that project or progress is actually being made? Well, um, the word hope is one that um, I don't use very often because mm -hmm. I think a lot of what's around is what I call false hope. And I, I'm not, I'm not optimistic about the near future. I think we've got some difficult times ahead. Um, but as I said earlier, I think what's going on is anti-life and it's it's against nature. Mm -hmm. And nature will triumph, but I think we're gonna have some some rocky roads between here and there. But that, that's why we're here. And I think in, in the sense of using the word hope, I think my 
I, I prefer to use the word sort of my my trust or my belief mm -hmm. in a, a higher purpose of why we're all here right now. And there's a reason why we're here right now and confronting these rather challenging times is that I, I just trust that it's whatever the results are going to be without being attached to to a particular result um that it, it it has its own process we're still in the middle of all of that so it's very hard to see where we're going when we're in the middle yeah. so just keep focused keep aware and keep connected through your heart and your feelings of knowing that trusting that whatever's going on we don't have to know what it is just know that there's a reason why we're all here right now and we have something to offer to this and what are we offering our consciousness and our awareness and the beauty of being here and what a wonderful opportunity to be part of this unfolding miracle um, quite and so. I, I really feel you know speaking of, of referencing the synchronicities we were talking about earlier mm. once i started doing this show i'd interviewed uh, about six months or so into it i interviewed uh, the founder of the live and let live mm -hmm. peace movement and was fascinated by what he was doing and it seemed like you know it was really resonant with it and then i found out that their offices that, that he's a defense attorney that runs a, a practice here in arizona called attorneys for freedom their office mm. three minutes away from my home and so I like, okay did the universe set this up or what <laughs> so right. i stepped up and uh shortly a few months later became co-executive director and the the philosophy is really interesting it, it's, it's beautiful two yeah. aspect of it the live which means you've got the right to live your life any way you so choose and mm. nobody has the the right to aggress upon you excuse me for Bless you. doing that thank you um my wife would say booster off um <laughs> and in that then there's this freedom to be anything you want to be as long as you're not harming another exactly and yeah. hopefully not mm -hmm. yourself too so that's <laughs> right. that's, that's what we call the moral side and, and we kind of present it as be an excellent human what's that mean high character first of all and then mm. those high character traits are in every religion and that and yet this is a little beyond that right because mm -hmm. there's no differentiation there's no separation we're all here mm -hmm. the let live side is what we call the legal principle which means don't aggress and our long-term goal is to remove aggression from the law which is mm. the only place that we can really from a practical side right we're talking yeah. about change is necessary and these are things that most people don't want to do because mm. that system is so corrupt that very few want to step in and get involved with it well over time this is going to be necessary and there will be others who are prepared and, and ready to step up and take their roles in doing so it mm. seems right just looking mm. at the playing field as, as to how it's unfolding yeah. Well, those mm -hmm. kinds of things long term i mean it could be 10 years 15 20 you know involving that kind of activity could eventually lead to actually outlawing war now that's going to take a lot of people most well, of you know I, th I think we've had that in the past in our ancient past there's lots of evidence for civilizations that we're not war warmongering yeah well it's time for us to make that shift because yeah it doesn't oh, yeah. do anybody again you know how do how can we well, love 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 and be <laughs> loved when we're killing people right now you know considering it from a another perspective that we all play our roles those people who are victims so to speak mm -hmm. of that activity they may have set things up prior to coming here to be able to do so as examples mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. being able to see that without the emotional trauma 
Mm -hmm. It gives us the ability to step back and deal with a little more effectively, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of that, because it's that emotional quagmire that we get sucked into that Mm -hmm. is hard to get out of. Yeah. Well, I I think it sort of goes with the territory of being on this planet. (laughs) We sort of get addicted to uh, being here in the physical world as opposed to other ways of being. Uh, not not part of this species, and it it is an it's an addiction, and we get it's an addiction well, to we, the physical we, world. We didn't have bodies before. We got to figure exactly. out how these bodies can feel. That's and right. And, that's and, right. Yeah. And that's from the out <laughs> perspective, right? This, this is what we can do. Mm. How do we be in that doing? And that's where we're beginning to look yeah. and be curious about it and explore as mm-hmm. to how that might affect yeah, how exactly. we all work together mm-hmm. so what what would you consider to be best advice as to how a person might be able to explore or, or be more present or um, just be more aware on a daily basis what are the kind of things that a person yeah. might do just to okay. be curious and check it out for themselves, right? Yeah. Because it's well, their own I, direct I, experience that's going to make the difference. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of little things you can do, <clears throat> just being aware. Um, like tuning in. Like so much of what we do is automatic. Mm-hmm. We don't even think about it. Like when you pick up a, a glass to have a glass of water, just think, oh, how does that I feel something? What does it taste like? I mean, sort of focus in on on the experience. And you can do the same with your dream states as well. I think the dreaming mm-hmm. state is really, really critical to, to explore and use it consciously because we work out a lot of things during our dreams. And if, if you can be conscious, just as you're falling asleep, say, okay, I'm just falling asleep. I'm comfortable. I'm safe. I'm loved. And what messages are available for me during the, the sleep state? And and just start playing around in the dream state, just as we play during the day. Mm-hmm. Do that consciously as you fall asleep. And a lot of very interesting things can come out of that. And I think that can open up a lot of other doors. And there's a lot of there's a lot of books. These are sort of timeless issues that our species has been delving into for thousands and thousands of years. So certainly it, not new. No, that's right. And I think it's the most exciting thing you can do is to start thinking about, well, what is this? And why am I here? And what am I experiencing in this moment? And those seem like totally curious kid kind of question of course we've adult, forgotten we dismiss we've forgotten yeah we've been distracted so we need to get our attention back on the basics and there's a lot you can do just with your own mind you're playing with your you're playing with yourself and your thinking and just like well it, it's really the study of the mind mm-hmm. and it's it's a beautiful, a beautiful process to go through. It truly is. And yeah. this has been just an amazing conversation uh, <laughs> that I'm sure our guests... Yeah, it's been fun. Out. Yeah. Oh, it really has. And, and that's the whole <laughs> idea, right? This, If we're not having fun, then we're probably doing something wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We can have lots of fun and still do good stuff, you know. Yeah, and then still work through the traumas and, and whatever sure. challenges we face, as long as we, you know, I call it excruciatingly fun sometimes, because in, <laughs> yeah. in the midst of it, it's really, eh, and then you yeah. get over it, or or you have enough of those cyclical processes happen to where you become aware of them, and then you realize, oh, this is happening again, and, and once I'm done, life's going to be really cool or much better. And so then you're anticipating rather than fearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that might be a key element as well. Um, Yeah. Wow. We could go on for 
Yeah, it can be. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank that, you really. very much, Sam. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Linda. And okay. Namaste and in la catch. Thanks yes. for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I'll see you next time.